All right, hello, and welcome to chapter 11. In this chapter, we're looking at meiosis and sexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction, two cells called gametes will come together, and these gametes come from two different parents. The process of the gametes coming together is known as fertilization. Often we say the sperm fertilizes the egg. So gametes are haploid. These, these cells only have one version of every gene. When they come together, they regenerate the diploid organism. So now the diploid organism has two versions of every gene, and these are located on what we call homologous chromosomes. By taking chromosomes from two different individuals, we increase genetic diversity in the offspring. And again, this is different from mitosis because in mitosis, we started with a single cell and we produced two identical daughter cells. Most plants and animals have two sets of chromosomes, and this is because they got one set from each of their two parents. So these are diploid organisms. If we want reproduction to occur from this point on, the first thing we need to do is reduce our chromosome number so that we don't have a doubling in every generation. For example, we don't want two diploid gametes to come together to generate a tetraploid organism. Instead, what we're going to have to do is generate haploid gametes. Remember, gametes are our sperm and egg, so that when we have two of them come together, we can regenerate the diploid organism. And the reproductive structures that do this, that produce gametes, and this is in humans or spores in plants, they're going to be generating cells like sperm and egg or uh, spores that have a single set of chromosomes, and we call these haploid cells. So the reproductive structures in humans are the gonads, like the testes and ovaries, and the gametes will be the sperm and egg, and those will be haploid cells. Let's compare mitosis and meiosis quickly. So remember in mitosis, the purpose was to generate identical cells, and this happens in all of our body cells, our somatic cells. We started with a single diploid cell, and we end up with two genetically identical diploid cells. So the ploidy does not change. In meiosis, we want to reduce the chromosome number. And meiosis happens in our sex cells, in our sperm and egg, or to generate our sperm and egg. We start with diploid germ cells, diploid cells, and we end up with haploid cells at the end of meiosis. The reason we end up with this reduction in chromosome number is because meiosis actually goes through two rounds of division. We're going to start with one cell and end up with two cells for the first division. And then meiosis two, we're going to go from, this is supposed to be a two right here, we're going to go from two cells to four cells. I really like this summary figure from the book. We're going to go through each of these phases in detail in the next few slides. So let's start with meiosis one. Just like mitosis, in meiosis, we still have interphase, a normal interphase that takes place before meiosis begins. And this includes the gap one, DNA synthesis, and gap two phases. So because we do have that DNA synthesis phase, chromosomes replicate in that S phase, making identical sister chromatids. So remember that this is one sister chromatid, and this is the identical sister chromatid. And they attach to one another at the centromere. And we can see that some spindles here will be attached later on. In prophase one of meiosis one, there are already many differences compared to mitosis. So in prophase one, we have homologous chromosomes come together very closely, and they're gonna be held together through something called the synaptonemal complex. This tight pairing of homologous chromosomes is known as synapsis. So remember, what are homologous chromosomes? Homologous chromosomes encode or carry the same traits, but different versions of those traits. So let's say this is oversimplified, but I could say, for example, that the red one, the red chromosome is from mom, and the dad's chromosome is, oh, sorry, the blue chromosome is from dad. And let me just pretend that right, let's see, this green color, right here, let me pretend that's the gene for hair color. Let's say that's brown hair. 
And then over here in that same location, but on the blue chromosome, that is the gene for hair color from dad. And that's a black colored hair, black hair. So this is oversimplified, but homologous chromosomes, just to demonstrate this example, they have genes. They're carrying the same types of genes, but different versions. So hair color from mom, hair color from dad, for example. So during prophase one, these homologous chromosomes pair tightly through synapses. And what's going to happen is they're going to swap parts with one another through something called crossing over, crossing over. So we'll see that in the next few slides. But during the crossing over process, you're going to see X-shaped structures right before or right at the location of their crossing over. And those X-shaped structures are going to be called chiasmata. Chiasmata, that's plural. Another term for this complex of a pair of homologous chromosomes um, being right next to each other, this is also called a tetrad because you can see four chromatids in this picture right here. Here is another picture showing the same thing, except here I can see the whole cell. I see my nuclear envelope is starting to break down. I can see my synapses, my pairs of homologous chromosomes that are tightly bound. I can see sister chromatids within just a single color like that from dad. And then my chiasmata, where the crossing over will be occurring. Chiasmata is plural. If you're looking at the singular word, this would be chiasma. So why does synapsis occur and those chiasmata form for crossing over? Crossing over is one form or one method of increasing genetic variation. And this is a picture from our book. Let's again pretend that dad's chromosome is shown in blue and mom's is shown in red. And remember, there are two because these are identical sister chromatids that were generated during the S phase of interphase. They have letters here. And we're going to learn this more in the next chapter, but these letters we call alleles, which are versions of a gene. And let's pretend A is like hair color, B could be eye color, C could be height, tall or short, for example. And again, this is super oversimplified, but I just want to give basic examples for now. And then we have small a for mom because she has a different version of those traits. Maybe she has a different hair color, eye color, and different height. During crossing over at those chiasmata, you can see that non-sister chromatids, so basically the homologous chromosomes from either parent, are going to form that chiasmata and cross over. They're going to swap some parts with one another. And at the end of this swapping, which happened again between non-identical sister chromatids, you can see that they are now carrying, for example, dad's chromatid right here is now carrying a little bit, some of the genes from mom. And mom's sister chromatid right there, or chromatid, is now carrying some information from dad. So now these sister chromatids are no longer genetically identical, but we still call them sister chromatids. So they're not genetically identical, but so for now, we're still calling them sister chromatids. And then for our last note on this slide, notice that the two chromosomes that swapped parts with one another are called recombinant chromosomes because they recombined some genes with one another. And the ones that did not swap are called non-recombinant chromosomes. Prometaphase one is similar to prometaphase of mitosis. Here we have our spindle fiber microtubules that are attached to the kinetochores at the centromeres. Remember the, let's see if I could sketch it really quick. We had our centromere here and the kinetochore proteins are right outside here. So the spindle fibers would be attached to those. And then this would be true for the homologous chromosomes. So if I had something like this and then I have dad's chromosome and I have my centromeres. Then I have my kinetochores. I'll draw them in green. Those are the kinetochore proteins. 
you can have spindles attached to those for a prometaphase one. The homologs are still attached to one another, so I didn't show that in this picture, but imagine those are still held together, and especially at the chiasmata. And the nuclear envelope by the end of prometaphase one will be completely broken down. Metaphase one is very different from metaphase of mitosis. In metaphase of mitosis, all of the chromosomes lined up single file on the metaphase plate. But as we can see here in metaphase one of meiosis, homologous chromosomes line up side by side along the equator or the metaphase plate. And I can see the kinetochores, they would be here and here, are facing opposite poles. So this tells me which side each of the homologous chromosomes will be pulled toward. Maternal and paternal chromatids are going to orient randomly, and they're mixed when they migrate to the poles. So what that means is that, let me see, what color can I use that stands out? Maybe yellow? If this is dad over here, and this is mom, remember mom, let's pretend mom is purple and dad is blue. So this one happens to be on this side and dad's happens to be on this side, but it could have easily been swapped. And then this one, dad is over here and mom looks like purple is down here. But again, this is it definitely could have been swapped as well. So the orientation of these chromosomes, maternal or paternal, is random. And each set is independent of the other. So this is the second method by which we create genetic diversity in the daughter cells. The first one was crossing over. The second one is this random orientation that we're going to see is called independent assortment or random assortment. So again, this is known as independent assortment. I think that's the more common name. Sometimes our book refers to this as random assortment, but this tells us that again, if this is metaphase, the metaphase plate, the way that the chromosomes line up is completely random. So this could be mom, this could be dad. In the next set, we could have dad, mom, dad, mom, mom, dad. It's random and each pair of chromosomes or each pair of homologous chromosomes sorts randomly and independently of the other pairs. As I mentioned, in addition to crossing over, independent assortment contributes largely to genetic diversity of our offspring. If you look at the number of combinations possible for a single cell, and this is for humans because we have 23 pairs of homologous chromosomes in humans, it's 2 to the 23rd power, and that gives us more than 8 million combinations for our future daughter cells. Here's another look at independent assortment. Remember, this happens at metaphase one. Let's pretend blue is dad and red is mom. And the longer chromosome, let's say that's like brown hair. Mom has blonde hair. And let's say the short one is eye color, maybe brown eyes, blue eyes. So after the end of meiosis one and then metaphase two of meiosis two, the cell over here will have brown hair, brown eyes, blonde hair, blue eyes, and then those chromosomes will be split into those cells after the sister chromatid split. And then over here, the possibility too, this will have brown hair, but blue eyes, and that's going to end up in this cell. And over here, we're going to have blonde hair, and brown eyes, that's gonna end up in that cell. And then again, after meiosis two is complete, you'll have a different combination of cells. We saw this picture already earlier, but I just wanted to point out again that since we have independent assortment here, you can see that the spindle fibers are binding to the kinetochores for each, either the maternal or paternal set of chromosomes in preparation for anaphase, when they're gonna be pulled apart. And we can see that again here, see the spindle fibers are shortening as the homologous chromosomes are being pulled apart. And that means that during anaphase one, those tetrads are now separated, they're pulled apart. But 
If you look, the sister chromatids are still intact. And what else is broken are those chiasmata where crossing over occurred. So because the tetrads are pulled apart, the chiasmata are also pulled apart. Sister chromatids are going to stay intact because they're going to be separated in meiosis II, in more specifically anaphase II of meiosis II. Our book also shows us some resulting gametes that may arise as a result of independent assortment. If we pretend the capital letters are dad's chromosomes and the lowercase letters are mom's chromosomes, you can see this cell is going to end up with dad's and this one will end up with mom's. And then when they split again for meiosis II, we have four gametes. And then on the right, they have a combination of dad and mom for one cell and mom and dad for the other cell. Again, if we're saying that capital letters are dad, dad's chromosomes and lowercase letters are mom's chromosome. And they're showing us the gametes after both meiosis one and meiosis two have been completed. And we finish off meiosis one with telophase one and cytokinesis. Again, just like in mitosis, the chromosomes arrive at opposite poles of the cell. And if cytokinesis does happen, remember cytokinesis is separation of the cytoplasm, then the nuclei are not going to reform. And this will be dependent on the species, the type of cell we have. Interestingly, by the end of meiosis one, we already generate haploid cells. So these two daughter cells will both be haploid. We started with diploid cells. So diploid, let's say we have two versions of the long chromosome, we have dad and mom, and two versions of the short chromosome, dad and mom. But by the end, let's look at just that cell, we only have one long chromosome and one short chromosome. Looks like the short one is from mom, and the long one, there's some recombination, but it looks like it's mostly, maybe mostly blue, so mostly dad's chromosome. So these are haploid cells. We already generate haploid cells and reduce chromosome number by the end of the first half of meiosis. So this is a review of our mitosis lecture, but remember that cytokinesis in animal cells will occur through a cleavage furrow that's formed through the contractile ring of actin filaments, which constricts and ultimately separates the two cells. But in plant cells, since they have a cell wall, they need to form a cell plate that ultimately leads to the formation of the cell wall to separate the daughter cells. All right, that takes us to the end of our first video for chapter 11. In the second video, we're going to look at meiosis 2 in more detail.